Uh, thank you very much. Um, in a recent speech, uh, Gary Shapiro, who is the president of the Consumer Electronics Association, the, organizer, uh, the organization that hosts CES in Las Vegas, explained that the consumer electronics market is expected to grow to one trillion US dollars next year, um, a fairly healthy increase. He went on to explain that the reason people are buying our products is that they're changing lives. They are changing the way, as he said, that we receive information and also changing communications, education, and entertainment. And despite the challenging economy worldwide, we in the consumer electronics industry are a bright spot. Well, ladies and gentlemen, rarely have we been in such a good position to transform our industry, to create products that will literally revolutionize the way consumers behave and entertain themselves. But to do that, we need to break out of the mold. We need to create inspired products. The iPhone and iPad were successful because those products were functional tools wrapped in an artistic body. They were nothing short of elegant, a word that I'll talk more about shortly. Whoops. I could see that uh, technology is. Could you back up a slide for me, please? Thank you. When I was um, researching this talk, and we actually talked about this this morning, I thought quite a bit about the word smart. And I decided to try to answer the question, are smart TVs actually smart? And I looked at this, um, this particular definition. It was pretty interesting because what I saw was sharp, characterized by sharp, quick thought. And I thought, well, that's, that's not exactly it. Amusingly clever. Hmm, no, that's not TV. Energetic or quick in movement. Well, maybe getting closer. And then I saw this definition, fashionable and elegant. Aha, elegant, it's an interesting word. Well, Matthew May, in a book on design, described this word elegant. His book was called In Search of Elegance. Why the best ideas have something missing. So let's actually dive into that a little bit more. A simple solution to a simple problem? Well, that's kind of obvious. It's not elegant. A complex solution to a complex problem? Hmm, that's sort of obvious too. That's not elegant. But a simple solution to a complex problem? Now that's elegant. Now, May went on to say that something is elegant if it's unusually simple and surprisingly powerful. So that's going to be our objective, our goal for smart TV. Now, when we actually talked to consumers in the early introduction of smart TV and to experts in the field, to reviewers, we asked them, what do you think about smart TV? What do you think about these products? And what would you like to see different? Well, it was really fascinating, the results. Because what they said was, it's too complicated. It's too complicated. It's a confusing user interface nightmare. That's not a good thing. We don't want 
our customers to tell us our products are confusing. John Maeda from the MIT Media Lab went on to take this point one step further when he said, oops, can we go back? He said, simplicity is about subtracting the obvious and adding the meaningful. Hmm, subtracting the obvious. Well, that's actually going to be one of the great challenges that we have is to imagine how to subtract the obvious. So I want to actually take us into the evolution or into the TV human interface into a little bit more detail. Let's start and talk about what do we mean by making a simpler interface? What do we mean by making an intuitive interface? What a natural interface is, is one that's simple and intuitive. One where we take the complexity away. Pointing is an innate human behavior. Do you know that we learn to point as humans before we learn to speak? As a matter of fact, if you ask a child to point out their favorite toy, they will point at it rather than speak. Why can't we bring that pointing paradigm to television? What's fascinating is when Apple brought the mouse to the computer in 1984, the computer was transformed from a productivity tool to an entertainment tool. When pointing was brought to the phone in 2007 with the iPhone, the phone was transformed as well. And now, recently, pointing has come to computers in a different form, in the form of a tablet. So I contend, and I challenge us, why can't we bring pointing to television? And what we're going to try to do is show you how pointing may work on television. Now, as I said also, not only does it have to be natural or instinctive, but it has to be elegant, which means we have to peel away the layers of complexity. We want a simple, unified experience across all of our devices in order to make an elegant design. And finally, we want our user interface to be fluid. Now, what do I mean by fluid? Well, let me actually give you a little bit of an analogy, um, a metaphor to help you understand the idea of fluidity, of what it means to be fluid. So many of you, you, you came to this hotel today, and you, um, let's say, instead of uh, driving yourself or taking uh, the train, uh, you took a taxi. Now imagine if you got in your house, in, into the taxi at your house, and I put a blindfold on you. I covered your eyes. And I only took off the blindfold at intersections, at the stoplights, at the crossroads. When you got to this hotel, if I asked you, how did you get here? You'd have no idea. You would not know. Because human brains are wired to see motion, to connect images together into a context, a contiguous context of motion. That fluidity is important as we move to a much more interactive television experience, a dynamic experience. I'd like to take this one step further. I'd like to try to take it one step further. OK, so we, though, have to take a step back from this whole discussion of interactive services and turn back to what Fer Frederick was talking about earlier, because we have to remember that, first and foremost, TV is about video. It's about having fun. It's about relaxing. So we need to make sure that when we add smart TV services, we think television first, video, and then we think about what comes around it. But we have to not forget that TV is not a PC. 
It's not a computer, and we don't want it to be one. Computers serve us individually, and TV serves us as a group. Computers are typically private, and television is typically a community experience. Computers have lots of menus and buttons and features, but we want television to be simple. So it's important that we remember this idea of lean back. Now this morning in the session, there was a discussion of lean forward, lean back, what should smart TV be? But I challenge all of us to re remember when we make televisions, they are about entertainment. And we typically don't like to work to be entertained. We want entertaining entertainment to be relaxing. So that's going to be the fundamental challenge. I want to actually illustrate this. Here we have a picture. Okay, So this is a picture of a group of friends watching football. I want to try, um, my device is not working well, but yeah. OK. So um, I'm not going to be able to quite demonstrate the way I wanted, but we'll, you'll just have to accept. So one of the uh, gentlemen is holding a beer with two hands, maybe a soju. OK. Another is holding the ball. Another is having fun, you know, raising his hands. Now, one person decides that he, they want to chat and they want to put the TV on pause. Or maybe they want to lower the volume because the doorbell rang. Whoops. So he picks up the remote. The remote. It's kind of big. Unfortunately, you can't hold this and the beer together because the beer takes two hands and this remote takes two hands. So we don't want that remote. We want the beer. All right. Now let's actually take this one step further. I'm at home. It's not me, but we'll imagine it's me. I'm at home with my wife, and we're watching a movie, right? One arm around my wife, popcorn. And the same thing, I, I realized that I'd like to change uh, the channel or may lower the volume, you know, do something, pause. Well, here's another smart TV remote. It's big takes two hands, it's a touch screen. Well, you know, we don't want that either. Because what we really want is our arm around our wife or partner. So one-handed operation for television, that's smart. Keep your beer, keep your partner. Now. There's something, there's a, there's a contradiction, maybe a paradox. We're talking about simplicity, but smart TV still needs a lot of capabilities. There, there has to be a lot that goes into making smart TV. So I want to actually talk about how we seamlessly blend these various services, but put it in the context of the user experience. The first thing is that it's as I said earlier, it's got to be about television first, then the apps. I'll say that again. TV first, then apps. Now, it also has to be about the web. Now, the web is a little bit complicated, because the question is, do you want a walled garden uh, do you want a limited number of websites? In the 90s, AOL delivered their first really successful 
web platform. And ultimately, AOL gave way to the open web because consumers don't want to be limited to where they go. They want total control. So from our perspective, it's important to create a web browsing experience that is designed for television. This is a screenshot of a Hillcrest application called Kylo, a browser specifically designed to allow consumers to use the open web in a TV setting. Games, one of the fastest growing categories. Of course, Nintendo popularized bringing a natural interface, a natural and instinctive motion UI to the gaming world. And what did Nintendo prove? Well, Nintendo proved that games are good for all the ages. They're not just about 18 to 24-year-old men on game consoles, that everybody loves to play a good game. And they love to do it as a community. More than 40% of mobile downloads Paid mobile downloads are games. This is going to be an important category. And finally, and maybe most importantly, um, new interactive experiences. Again, in the discussion on HBB TV, this is an example of being able to overlay interactivity and interesting services on top of live television. Now, there are a lot of regulatory issues and business model issues associated with this particular application. But we believe that over time, as people become aware of the value of merging these kinds of applications um, with live television, we'll see more of them. This here is not part of the, of the football game. It's an actual interactive app that is controlled by a point and click interface that lets consumers directly access applications that are of interest to them. So there's a big, though, question mark here forming. Well, that seems on that previous slide like a lot of features, doesn't it? And I said that complexity is the enemy of smart TV. So how do I reconcile that? Well, Matthew May said, something is elegant if it's unusually simple and surprisingly powerful. Hmm. So instead of thinking each of those apps or those categories of apps um, as many, many features, imagine each one, each category is one feature. A game API with, an, with a highly um, interactive, pointing or motion interface that enables a whole class of games, or a web, single web browser that gives you access to the entire web and all the applications that come with it. So the way to think about that is that there's a difference between content and features. What we want are few features, but a lot of content. Let me actually take that further. Many of us have our iPhones or smartphones or Android phones of some sort or another. And these devices, if you think about how many features they have to control the environment, they're very few. As a matter of fact, when the iPhone came out, a lot of people complained that it wasn't really a good phone. But it didn't really matter because it allowed you to point and click and swipe it had very, a simple human API, human interface, that enabled a wealth of functionality right at your fingertips. So we're going to try to bring that same experience to TV. Now, Hillcrest, many of you have not heard of. We're a small company. Um, I founded the company about 10 years ago. My expertise is in 
human factors design and cognitive psychology and engineering. And I combine the notion of better user interfaces with, with the, the platforms of television. We set out to solve the problem of simplifying interactive television. And what we discovered after years of experimentation and research and a lot of trial and error was that a natural user interface controlled by a simple motion device, a simple in-air pointing device, really changes the way consumers can interact with their screens. I was actually hoping to show you this device but it turns out we're having some technical difficulties that's making, um, making it not possible in this room. But hopefully I'll give you a little bit of a taste of it shortly. What I want to do is start and go back to those, that four quadrant and actually show you some applications. Now, this application looks pretty typical, right? It looks like a program guide that most people have seen before. But it's a special kind of program guide because it doesn't actually use a D-pad, an up, down, left, right remote control. It uses a mouse or a cursor, a point and click interface. So if you bear with me, I'm gonna ask from a technical standpoint, if we can run, can you run this video for me please? Just click, okay. So In here we have a, an application, we're watching television. Closes. Right? Stephen We're going to click on the guide. We're going to come and browse by scrolling a scroll wheel instead of using up, down, left, right. We have categories of content that we can actually filter by just pointing and clicking at them. We see something in the guide, we pull up our DVR, we do one button selection, and we go back to television. Now, that's fluid, integrating multiple functions together and making it possible to add capabilities, fairly sophisticated capabilities that are extremely easy to implement. I literally did all that in the course of 15, 20 seconds. Browse, graze for categories, what we call look in individual categories, find a D, something in the future, select it, record it, and go back to television, all with point and click. Now, that's the first thing. Now, why did I use a traditional guide, though? Why did I make it look traditional? Well, because we also believe that even though consumers adopt revolutions easily, we also recognize that they need a stepping stone from the present to the future. And so making a familiar experience like this is important. Whoops, let's go back to the previous. Okay, oh, one more, next. Okay, so let's talk about music for a second. Music is often not talked about on television, but consumers leave their televisions on many hours a day. In the United States, the average right now is about five, between five and six hours a day. Now, people are not sitting in front of the TV five or six hours a day, but they leave it on and they use it as background noise. What we wanted to do is see if there was a way to use interactivity, to use smart TV, to enhance the music experience. Again, using a natural UI. So this application was designed in conjunction with Rhapsody, a, a subscription music service. What we're gonna do is run this video, and again, I'm gonna explain. What you'll be seeing is, again, point and click ease on television using a visual experience to make music part of our lives. So here's the home screen. I see an artist that I've never seen before, and I decide, let me actually play one of her songs. I pick the song and I add it to my player. But I like that song, so I want to explore her more. I see more of her songs, and we've created an editorial sample, a sampler that allows me to add to my, uh, my playlist. Okay? So this is a sample. In the meanwhile, I can continue to browse her content. Albums, look at her top tracks. I can get a 
Married actually be interested in hearing. So what we've done is taken music and made it, made it interactive and made it appropriate for television by bringing a visual motion interface um, to the platform. Let's go to the next one. OK, photos. Well, everybody takes photos. You know, in 2011, an astounding 300 billion digital photos have been taken worldwide. 300 billion. That's amazing. So the question is, instead of using DLNA and computer protocols to pull photos into our televisions in very uninspired ways, why can't we actually create applications on TV that really match to the, the fun um, kind of personal experience of photos. So I want to actually take you through a couple of examples on photos because I believe that photos are often an afterthought in television. Let's, if you could uh, run this first video. So this is a photo browser. We're going to go in again, point and click. Now I get a visual experience and I scroll through the directories. I see, um, I rem I'm reminded of a vacation I went on but now I want to actually move through the months because I missed the month. And I can actually swipe. I can literally swipe through the photos. And finally, when I find the picture that I remember, I can bring up the great, great photograph of my uh, nephew and, um, and explore it and, and see it. Now, let's go to the next, uh, next slide. I want to actually take this a little bit further because this shows the essence of elegance. In my family, photography is really important. I'm a, an avid photographer, and I've taken a ton of photographs. And interestingly, I waited till the very last moment to switch from film photography to a digital photography. Why? Because what we used to do is take pictures out of our vacations, and then we would um, spread them all out on the dining room table and make photo albums. We'd paste them in with receipts and brochures, and make these interactive, these nice books that people could pick up and look through. But with the advent of digital, we said, hmm, how are we going to do the same thing? And how are we going to do it simply? So this is an application that's called Collage, where I can look at pictures. And as you saw when I was talking, I could pick an individual picture that looks interesting to me and pull that picture to me and have the platform automatically find similar pictures from that date and time and pull them toward me. So in a sense, I've recreated that idea of, of, the, in, of the photo album, the physical photo album, and I've placed it on television in a dynamic but simple way. That's what we're trying to accomplish in Smart TV. Let's go to the last one. Last video, we talked about games. This is a fairly common matching game. This is the Mahjong game. And um, let's ro roll this video, please. So a game like this cannot really be implemented with a traditional remote control. It's a pattern matching game. And in games, we want them to be dynamic. And we want to look at the screen always. So when I pull up a pattern, I want to quickly be able to point at one tile and then point at the other. As I'm looking around and trying to find the next pattern, I don't want to look down at my remote. I want to continue to stare at the screen, find a pattern, and select it. It's this kind of, of intuitive, heads up, always looking at the screen experience in gaming that, that uh, will transform it. Next slide, please. OK, so where do we go from here? Well, just to summarize what I just talked about is we want a natural interface. We want to be able to perform all of the kinds of, of uh, navigation that one would want to do in a content environment like television. We want to be able to easily find content. By the way, we didn't show you in these video clips the notion of just pointing and clicking at an, at an on-screen keyboard. 
um, which turns out we've demonstrated if it's designed well, consumers can type on screen at almost 20 words a minute. And what's interesting is that they have the capacity to use predictive look ahead and ultimately coupled with other tools to really enhance the search experience. Right now, today's television systems don't give you that ability to find easily. Grays is the idea of having a general idea of what I want and going to that category, maybe a sitcom or a drama or a movie. And browse, of course, when I don't know what I want and I want the TV to help me find something of interest. It has to be elegant as a standalone smart TV, but it also has to be elegant when matched to phones and tablets. And so using a common experience, pointing and clicking, makes it possible to unify the user interface across platforms. And fluid is a necessity. We want to bring motion to the user interface because it is, after all, about television. And it is through motion that we enable consumers not to get lost in a hierarchy of hundreds of applications or deep within an app, a, a program guide or another application. So what I'm looking for us all to do in this industry is not create smart TV, create smarter TV. So where can we go? Well, let's imagine that smart TV is the user interface hub from the home. Let's also imagine that it's the unified communication hub for the home. This is an actual screenshot of an application that's personalizable, that has your local weather. It has a video um, port, and it has other applications or applets built into it. Some folks call these widgets. But over time, we might imagine the smart TV will provide a video conference, as Jeff said earlier, a very important application, enable, for example, you to answer your Skype video call, or potentially answer the front door when somebody rings the bell and you see a video. So there is not only the notion of connecting devices together, but connecting multiple aspects of our home together. This will be where the future is. So I have been talking a lot about the input device. The input device is extremely important. This uh, device at the top left, you probably recognize. It's the, um, it's the companion to this device. It is a, um, a Google TV remote control. Sony actually did quite an elegant job of designing from an industrial design perspective, this device, given that it has 90 buttons, or close to it. But LG decided to go in a different direction. And we believe this is the way of the future, taking the buttons away and virtualizing the functionality on the screen where people want to be always looking. Um, and it is in that perspective that I think we can make a lot of, um, a lot of uh, innovation. Now, I want to take you into this a little more. This is a complicated chart, so, so don't try to understand this, but what we're introducing here is an important concept called the IXR. You know, it's very hard to decide which remote control is better than another remote control. Should it be hand-waving like Connect? Should it be sign language? Or should it be a little device that just disappears into your hand like this one? Or should it be a keyboard like this? How do I tell? So Hillcrest has introduced the idea of this sort of parameterization, a quantification of the various input technologies as it applies to the use cases of smart TV. So there are many different input modes that might be relevant to a particular application. Maybe um, cursor control, like I was showing you in those applications. Maybe for a game, it's linear or angular position. And what we are basically showing is that if you take a particular input technology, like up, down, left, right, this is basically a traditional remote control. It covers 
a number of the different input modes that might be relevant to smart TV, but not that comprehensively. It's, it's not that many of them. Well, Hillcrest developed a motion technology, an inertial pointing technology called FreeSpace. FreeSpace has um, the ability to sense multiple degrees of freedom very accurately. And hence, it supports a wider range of input modes. Essentially, it has a higher IXR than a traditional remote control. Now, over time, we'll add capabilities to our remote controls. We will want to expand the number of modalities that are supported. So, for example, voice. It would definitely be valuable to have a microphone and in certain instances use the microphone to communicate or maybe enter a search term. You wouldn't always want to use the microphone. For example, you wouldn't want to be sitting at home or imagine sitting at home and say, can I have some adult content, please? Right? That wouldn't necessarily be a good thing. But what about a bar? or a sporting event, or a, a venue where there's a lot of background noise. So the key is that we want to use the right tool for the right job. Eventually, we will add a camera as well. Cameras are excellent for immersive gaming, as Microsoft has proven with Kinect, swinging or kicking. That's an excellent um, application for cameras. But we don't want to confuse that with relaxed and lean back control, where I might have my hands behind my back or, or maybe just be lying, lying down. We want to make sure that the experience is not one where we have to teach people a whole new language, a whole new sign language. What makes the tablet and the, and the smartphone work so well is this innate ability. But it's important to remember one thing about innate. Innate does not mean you don't have to learn it. We all learned how to, to expand the picture right, and contract it. We all learned the zoom function on a smartphone. Somebody had to show us. So innate and instinctive doesn't mean no education, no training. What it means is it's very little training that you can learn it on the first time. So what should you take away from all of this? Well, first, TV is about entertainment. It's about having fun. And it's about having fun for everyone, for all ages, from the youngest to the oldest. Everybody should be able to use smart TV. It should be about television, not about computers. And the interface should not take two hands. It should fit in one hand and be small and invisible. It should be relaxed. Our brand of pointing we call relaxed relative pointing. And it's a topic that, if you're interested, I'd like to uh, talk to you further about. You don't want to have to directly point at the screen, because that means your arm is always up, pointing. And that gets tiring. Like a mouse on a computer, I want to point in a relative form. When I'm moving here, I'm moving up there. That's the right way to do point and click interfaces. And remember. It's not about features. Features do not generate more revenue. Content generates revenue. So don't confuse the two. So certainly, um, at Hillcrest, we have spent the last uh, decade learning how to transform television, make it more dynamic, and help our partners around the world use these new technologies to create new experiences on TV. Our free space technology is an inertial motion technology, and they can help you design smart TV services and platforms using natural user interactions. So 
Um, thank you very much for your time, and I'd love to uh, spend, answer any questions. Any questions? No questions. Ah, yes. And thank you for your presentation. Um, I ca I'm working in Samsung Electronics. Uh, actually, so we have lots of uh, <coughs> concern about the next uh, user interface for smart TV success. Uh, in, this in this point is uh, one of your presentation material, uh, voice recognition. It's a so-called people uh, uh, told voice recognition is, will be the next generation promising technology for handling and controlling smart TV. But, uh, it's, uh, but uh, not successful is until now. It's uh, currently, because it's a uh, voice recognition th is uh, very uh, uh, directive and very easy tool for controlling TB, but uh, people does not like uh, uh, <laughs> uh, so controlling TB using their voice. Right. So uh, could you, uh, do you think there's uh, some specific reason for the human behavior about is voice recognition or is voice uh, controlling? Yes. Uh, that's an excellent question, um, really an important one. Uh, it's actually a whole topic. Um, there is a voice um, is, a, is actually challenging. When humans talk to non-humans, when a human talks to an inanimate object, um, a piece of technology, uh, it's uncomfortable for humans. They actually don't like to do that. We don't, we don't like to talk to something that we don't think is human-like. There's a word for that, anthropomorphic. We want the device to appear like a human. And so it is a challenge um, when we talk through a voice a response system, what's called interactive voice response, IVR, we're usually okay doing that because we imagine the, the, uh, com the computer on the other side is a human. Um, but when we just have a TV and we're talking to it, we don't have that same kind of connection. So at Hillcrest, we don't think voice is the right tool to do control. But it's, we think that initially in smart TV, voice will be used for, for uh, chat, uh, for interacting with social services. So we're using our voice to do things that we normally like to do.